So hi everyone, I'm Mark Tewksbury and I'm defending the novel Washington Black on Canada Reads 2022. Washington Black is about an 11 year old slave boy, Wash, the book's narrator, plucked up and given opportunity, who turns out to be a prodigy, a brilliant illustrator. Through him, we bear witness to a globe trotting adventure that's driven at first by escape, then science and exploration. We also bear witness to Wash's unsettling, sometimes brutal, yet ultimately inspiring struggle to discover what it means to truly be free. Essie Adujan is the author of Washington Black and she's here with me to talk about it. Hello, Essie, how are you doing? Hi, Mark, I'm so delighted to be here. So let me just start. First of all, I wanna tell you the reason I chose the book is because I think it's the kind of book you start reading, you know, at eight o'clock at night and you have to force yourself to turn off the light at, at midnight because you got to get up the next morning and work, but you just, you can't stop reading. It's epic in every way. And although it's set in 1830, I really think it, can, I think it connects us with issues that still ring true in 2022. So that's why I chose this book to defend on Canada Reads. Oh, well, thank you so much. I was so uh, thrilled to see that you'd chosen it. Um, uh, I, you know, remember distinctly watching your gold medal win uh, at the Barcelona Olympics. Um, I think it was back in, well, you would know better than I, uh, like 92. And, and yeah, so later this you would have 14. I probably, yeah, thereabouts, thereabouts. Yeah, wow. so, uh, such a, yeah, so happy to meet you and, and to be doing this with you. It's, thank you. Thank you. Me too. Listen, one of my biggest challenges is Washington Black is hard to sum up in a few sentences because it's such an epic adventure. So I get to talk to the source here. How, how do you describe the book? Uh, the book is, um, as you said, it's, it's an epic adventure, but it's really about the process of self-discovery of an 11-year-old uh, field slave who uh, one day gets um, very unexpectedly plucked out of his harsh, raw life circumstances and then transported uh, into worlds that he could never have conceived of or imagined uh, when he was um, you know, a, a field slave. And so it's really him finding his footing in the world, um, I guess, exploring new relationships, allowing himself to find love, uh, but really him uh, finally uh, feeling at home within himself and, and, and coming into uh, his sense of being like a fully realized human being. So it's a psychological journey as much as it's um, you know, a physical journey through various landscapes. Um, you know, we have the Arctic, we have Barbados, we have London, um, but it's really about his emotional uh, well-being and, and, and ultimately uh, his, his feeling uh, that um, he has to construct his own idea of, of, um, of home in the world. I love that. I mean, uh, that really helps me a lot, actually. I'm going to use some of that in my defense. Yay. OK, uh, let me start with the writing. Um, you know, this is Canada Reads, after all. And of course, it's beautifully written, deeply affecting packed with feeling. That's why I really connected with this book. And I love how you start chapters. And so we didn't die. Ah, oh, but the cold and my personal favorite, Norfolk steak. <laughs> I will <laughs> never get the taste of that seed out of my memory. It was so palpable. So in doing research for this book, I mean, you, you just so incredibly describe so many different parts of the world in a different era. What stands out with you from doing all of the research? Um, I mean, there was just, I, I guess for me, one of the joys of the book was to do that research and to be able to immerse myself in, in different, um, I guess, aspects of an 1830s world, uh, different environments, different places. Um, you know, you wouldn't maybe always simultaneously think of, uh, you know, Arctic exploration uh, in the same, you know, in the same maybe thought that she would think of, uh, 1830s Barbados plantation life, like just to put those two things together, uh, I, I think is, is an interesting um, dichotomy. Um, there were points in the research that were very obviously difficult, um, having to research slave life um, on Barbados um, was, it was quite harrowing, um, but, you know, I just allowed myself to, to 
take breaks and, and to step away from that when I needed to step away from that. And then also to kind of turn towards the more uh, joyful aspects of the book uh, as well, um, which is you know, certain scenes taking place in Nova Scotia, for instance, when Washington uh, finally uh, finds a kindred spirit uh, to love. And, and so, you know, that was that was very pleasurable. You know, that part of the book, I, believe it or not, I, re I read Call Me By Your Name last year, and it had a bit of feeling of, you know, that that sort of innocent first love and that like the to step into that part of the book. I agree. It was it was one of the more joyful and fun parts of the book for me to read as well. Um, you talk about dichotomy. So I'm going to jump to this. I, I just love that on one hand, there's this quest for science and data and facts. And then on the other hand, there's kind of this quest to understand or make sense out of people or situations that we'll never be able to make sense of. And it's the same with this idea of us all being replaceable, which we could interpret as our lives are meaningless. And then at the same time, all moments are worthy of curiosity. So can you elaborate on these sort of dichotomies and tensions in the book? Yeah, I, I feel like, um, and this was a very deliberate act, is that uh, Washington and, and Titch are kind of perfect foils of each other. You have somebody who, uh, at the outset of the book, Wash, uh, who's very much uh, steeped in a kind of, um, uh, I guess, West African uh, mythology in terms of how he confronts the world, um, a West African sense of spirituality that he inherits from Big Kit. You know, they believe in reincarnation, and then that's a very strong, um, it basically becomes a kind of anchor, uh, because if you believe that you're you're going to wake up free uh, in another world, uh, you know, that's that's probably the only thing that's kind of getting you through the hardships of this world. Uh, and so he's very much um, at the outset of the novel, uh, steeped in this, this uh, kind of spirituality. Uh, and then, you know, you have Titch, who's very much, a, you know, I guess, scientifically minded, um, very much steeped in the rational, uh, or what we would consider, um, I guess, European rationality or principles of rationality. And then you see as they, you know, as the book progresses and they start to sort of, uh, I guess, spend more time with each other and connect, by the end of the novel, they've sort of switched places a little bit. You see that Washington has really um, become much more uh, preoccupied with ideas of, of what is rational. And, and then you have um, Titch who's moved to a more, I guess, mystical realm. And so you have, again, that tension uh, between them, uh, just because Washington wants a very rational answer as to, you know, where Titch went and, and you know, what were his ultimate feelings and, and, you know, just a kind of feeling like if he could get very cut and dried answers, this would resolve something about his sense of, um, of being, um, you know, at sea in the world. But Titch at that moment has gone to another place and this is not something that he can offer. Uh, he's, you know, he says, I, I was there for you. I've always been there, uh, you know, as though he is, uh, he was in the, the snow or in the water, so had become some part of the elements. And this is uh, insufficient uh, for Wash. He, he really can't, um, he was gone to another place. So, you know, I really feel like throughout the, the novel, there are these kind of, um, dichotomies uh, that I was working with. And that was so interesting to me. How do you move somebody from one mindset to the other? And, and what does that do to their relationships uh, that they thought were, you know, because we have a sense of our relationships a lot of the time as being um, in some sense set, like immutable, that I know how this person is going to react, especially in a marriage. You know, you have a sense of like, this is how my partner is and, and this is how, uh, you know, he or she or they will always be. And, uh, but, but then sometimes you get these surprises where somebody has changed their thinking or somebody has moved from, from one position. And then how do you reckon with that? Especially when you've kind of maybe moved over more to their position and then you find that they don't hold it anymore. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, all of these are, are uh, inherent in the book and, and were so interesting to write. I, and I just, so interesting to read and so joyful to read because that tension is super interesting. And I have to say, I was deeply unsatisfied with Titch's response to Wash at the end of the book. And that's perfect. Like I thought you were, I thought it was 
like great that that least I'm glad it wasn't wrapped up neatly and he gave Wash exactly what he needed it it was unresolved and that was just I love that line where Titch realizes or Wash realizes we've spent so much of our lives together at the end of the day we 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 won't see the same we won't see things the same way I just have to accept that um so obviously this whole theme of, of freedom or lack thereof runs throughout the book I would say from the opening sentence right to the closing line um, for you as the author, you know, what were some of the key um, things that Wash had to overcome to find freedom? Key obstacles. Yeah, I mean, initially those obstacles to freedom were uh, rooted in his position as, as being a field slave, right? You don't have any kind of uh, freedom over your own body even. So you know, this lack of physical freedom was something that very much uh, governed the contours of his life. But as he broke out of that, uh, or was wrenched uh, out of that um, situation and taken out into the greater world, uh, and then ultimately left to find his own footing, you know, the question then became one of um, a sort of uh, well, initially intellectual freedom, but then a kind of, um, I guess, spiritual freedom for him or like really the sense of personally feeling, um, I guess at home enough uh, in his body, uh, but also at home enough in the world uh, and, and not tethered by all of the darkness that he's experienced in the past. Um, obviously we carry with us various traumas, um, you know, especially from childhood, we carry so much uh, with us into the world, but you know, I, probably the balance um, that we eventually strike is is figuring out how much um, we are going to allow those traumas to define us and, and to confine us, really. To like, what what limits are we going to um, let those past wounds place on on how we live our lives? And I think for him, this is a very difficult thing. I mean, he's been through so much, uh, and on top of that, he's got this this feeling of abandonment. And, and so really, I think the second half of the book is him working through this. And I mean, he's told by his partner, Tana, like, why can't you just let this go? You're, you're free. Um, but clearly you're not free mentally. You're still kind of tethered to, uh, you know, to this, this man who seems to represent something of your past that is obviously very unresolved for you. So um, really he has to work through this process of, um, of intellectual and, and spiritual freedom, um, even while he's physically free. Um, yeah. so I love that about this book. I love that nuance and that subtlety of freedom is not a zero sum game. And just because you have freedom doesn't mean you are free or feel free or can be free in your own life. And I love the markers along the way. So for me as the reader, I, there were moments, a, a huge one was in Nova Scotia where Wash picks up his drawing instruments on his own free will for the first time. And I felt like, wow, so that's a huge marker on his journey here because no one, you know, he was forced to draw before really, right? And now he chose it. So I, I, just really powerful, those markers. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And your reading of the book is so subtle. And yeah, I'm very excited to hear, uh, to hear your defense because this is <laughs> <laughs> um, you talked about sort of the joyful part of the book. What was the most terrifying moment in the book for you? You know, it's it's funny. I, for me, the moments of violence were were the most terrifying uh, aspects to write about. In particular, um, this is a bit of a spoiler, but just everything around surrounding cousin Philip. You know, like mm -hmm. I really felt like I yes. had to take. Um, and it's interesting because that was one of the scenes that came out. Uh, almost wholly as we see it in the book, like there was very little editing uh, that needed to be done. But I felt like psychologically, I really had to work myself <laughs> up to, wow. to write that scene. It was just a lot. Um, so I, I maybe the cousin Philip. Uh, I think that's a great, yeah. great. That's not my answer. I love that that's yours. Okay. And that, that is totally. Yeah. But for me, Wash sitting in the bar 
having his meal and he comes face to face with somebody that he doesn't want to. I won't do a spoiler. Oh, and just that whole part of the book. I mean, we, we feel the surveillance and that intensity of knowing you're being watched. And that was very unsettling. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I brought you back there, did I? <laughs> yeah, 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 you did. I know. I, I sort of hadn't thought about that for a while. But yeah, I remember writing that. And, and it, those scenes uh, in Nova Scotia were, were for me, you know, a pleasure because it's like his first friendship is is developing with Medwin and he finally has this um, this routine that he's established and he's he's kind of setting up this this life for himself. It's a very kind of narrow life, but he, he you know, he's finding his feet and then, you know, but there's always that that feeling of surveillance like you're talking about. Here's the big final question. The theme okay. of Canada Reads this year is one book to connect us. And you know I'm going to be asked this a million times, so I thought I'd try it to you first. How does Washington Black connect us, Essie? Oh, that you know, that's such a that's such a hard question to answer. It's such a large one. Um I agree. I'm glad to hear you say that because it, I, I'm gonna have to really unpack this one. Yeah, I mean just hearing the pleasure that you took in the novel and hearing you talk about it and hearing you kind of, you know, just very delicately picking out the themes and all of this. I mean, that is what every writer would hope for, is somebody to read that passionately and that um, sensitively, their work, mm -hmm. and then to go on and, and talk about it with others who, who, you know, will read the book, hopefully, uh, with the same degree of passion. And I think, you know, reading is connection, right? Just to speak Absolutely. of it on a, a kind of um, larger level. I think that that just the excitement and, and the pleasure, that's very infectious. Uh, and then we can start to kind of look, um, you know, very critically at some of the, the themes of the book, which are themes that we're all kind of dealing with. Um, ideas of personal freedom. Um, personal discovery. Personal discovery, exactly. Meaning and value of life right now in this time where what we knew isn't going to be what's going forward exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, the, the tension between uh, how we perceive ourselves and, and what we can claim for ourselves versus um, these kind of societal tethers, um, you know, whether it's um, a feeling of... Um, of surveillance, like you brought up, um, you know, as a person of color, uh, moving through certain spaces, you know, these are still tensions that are with us, um, or, or, you know, whether it's just, um, I guess, having a sense of what's possible in one's life. Oh, Essie, you know, I could do this all day, but yeah, I won't keep you anymore. <laughs> Thank you so We're much for you. Thank you. And thanks for answering all of my questions. And, and Essie, I, I look forward to championing your book. Oh, I'm still looking forward to hearing uh, you champion it, Mark. Delighted. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye.